Hello and welcome to Global Pulpit, where the world is our parish. My name is Camille Magdaly from the Ministry of Teach All Nations, empowering through word and spirit. Our goal is very simple. We want to give you God's unchanging word for changing times. And we want to help through the prophetic word to spawn global revival. As led by the Holy Spirit, and in conjunction with the body of Christ worldwide. So welcome to our program. We want to help you navigate through this very challenging time. It's not just one challenge. It's a multitude of challenges, whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic, or whether it is rioting and recession, lockdowns, turbulence in the U.S. elections, turbulence among the nations. It just seems to be one wave after the next, after the next. People are weary. People are tired. People are fearful. People, even Christians, are thinking of giving up. Well, let me give you some strong pastoral counsel here. Don't do it. Galatians 6 verse 9 tells us, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we will reap if we don't give up. Very sound advice. Well, friends, rather than running from the giants, running from the source of stress, running from problems, there are times in life that rather than run, we turn around and we fight. The Christian life is a fight. And the Apostle Paul told young Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. Now, there are times in life to flee, like from fornication and youthful lust. That's what the scripture says. Flee from these things. But when it comes to faith, we fight. But bearing in mind, we don't do it on our own. We don't do it just in our own strength. We do it in partnership with God. He is the senior partner and we are the very junior partners. But it's a dynamic duo. And can I just say that even when the forces of darkness and opposition seem so powerful, never forget what it says in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So don't give up. Remember that when the battle seems to be the hottest and you are tempted to throw in the towel, that's usually the point when you're just a whisker away from a breakthrough. The night is darkest when the moon goes down and the sun is about to shine. So if you just persevere a little bit more, you will get that blessing, that breakthrough, that answer to prayer. Very important point. Well, we're going to learn how to slay the giants with five smooth stones. We're going to learn about that in this particular segment of Global Pulpit. Now, of course, I'm speaking about David and Goliath. Talk about asymmetrical warfare. You have a giant from Gath. He's one of the Philistine cities. He is three meters tall. His body is like a piece of weaponry. So unarmed, he can still be dangerous. But he also has a sword, a spear, a shield. Put him against young David, a teenager, And all that David has is a slingshot and five smooth stones. How is he going to prevail? Well, he does prevail. And we're going to learn how through the five smooth stones. So stay tuned. Let's remember that the obstacle with Goliath is that he was a bully. Bullies try to intimidate, cause to fear, cause to fret, cause to despair, the object of their bullying. We've all faced it sometime in our lives growing up, but let me just say, there is a way to bring down the bully, the giant, but you have to work with God. You can't do it on your own. It won't happen. The second thing we learn about Goliath is that he's a blasphemer. Now, blasphemy is to grievously insult the living God, and we don't want to do that. So, blasphemy is something you avoid. We don't want to take God's name in vain. We don't want to insult God. We're called to praise and bless God. Well, Goliath didn't do that. He didn't know God. He didn't want to know God. He just thought, really, that he was better than the God of Israel. 
and he was in for a rude awakening. Now, the amazing thing is that God chose David as the weak things of the world to confound the wise. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27 to 29. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, the base things of the world, the things that are despised God has chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught the things that are that no flesh can glory in his presence. So yes, what are the giants today? Let me just name a few of them for you. Terrorism is a giant. Immorality is a giant. Lawlessness and rebellion, giants. False ideology, false religion, and sometimes false ideologies are a religion. That's a giant. Deception, fear, hatred, depression, lust, culture of death, cancel culture, radicalism, fundamentalism, Jezebel, who loves to destroy as well as to control, and Molech, the false god of the Amorites, or actually the Moabites, I believe. All these are the problem. But we're going to now focus on the solution. Slaying giants with the five smooth stones. I want to invite you to read with me from the Word of God now, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 41 to 51. Again, 1 Samuel chapter 17, 41 to 51. This is the word of the Lord. So the Philistines came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistines looked about and saw David, the Philistine, singular, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. Now the Philistine, of course, is Goliath. Verse 43, So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Please remember that. This is God's battle. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Obviously, David was not afraid of anyone. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face on the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. This is the word of the Lord from 1 Samuel 17, verses 41 to 51. So friends, what do we learn? The five smooth stones. This is God's battle. When the battle is no longer your battle, but you give it to God, it's his battle. And God fights, and God wins. But we can and should cooperate with God. So how are we going to do it? Well, we have the five smooth stones. Now remember, David was a teenager, but he didn't lack in experience. And we're going to learn about that in a moment. So what is the first of the five smooth stones? Well, I would say 
It's called conviction. And that's in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26. What is the conviction? Well, when Goliath was taunting the armies of Israel in the valley of Elah, and by the way, a quick geography lesson, the Philistines lived on the coastal plain in such cities as Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Ekron, and Gath. The Israelites lived up in the mountains to the east. We call them the Judean mountains. In between the coastal plain and the high Judean mountains, which are approximately 2,500 meters or more above sea level, was the lowlands called the Shephelah. Shephelah. The Shephelah was like a stair step, a bumper or buffer, I should say, zone and a stepping stone between the Judeans in the hills and the east and the Philistines on the coast in the west. Whoever controlled the Shephelah, be it Philistine or Israelites, could menace and control the other side. <clears throat> and it was in the Shephelah that our hero Samson, from Judges 14 to 16, lived. And he judged Israel for 20 years. So it's in the Valley of Elah, in the Shephelah, which means lowlands, that the Philistines wanted to control it so they could be in striking distance of hitting the Israelites up in the mountains. Now, conviction. What was David's conviction? When Goliath was taunting the armies of Israel, David saw this, he heard the blasphemy, he heard the insults, he heard the menacing, and he says this, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David had a conviction that you just don't touch God or his honor, and that those that do and go too far must pay the price. He wasn't intimidated by Goliath's size or by his weaponry or by his big mouth. He knew that God is bigger than Goliath. Indeed, God is Lord over all. So he had a conviction, who is this guy that he's blaspheming, insulting our armies, and for that matter, God himself. Conviction is important. And I would say there are some courageous people without conviction, and there's some convicted people without courage. Well, we need both, and let me say, God will help you with both. If you want to get some wonderful, long-lasting convictions, then learn the Word of God, and you'll get plenty. You'll get an eternity worth of conviction. So our first stone is conviction. David had it, and so should you. If we're going to slay giants, we need to know what our values, our unifying principles, our conviction. The second stone, it should go without saying, but I'm going to say it. It's called courage. This is chapter 17 of 1 Samuel, verses 32 to 36. David had courage. We hear a lot about leadership. In fact, sometimes that's all we hear about is leadership. But I'd be honest. Very seldom do I hear about the element of courage in sound leadership. Well, to me, it's like, apart from vision, the most primary and fundamental thing. You need courage or you won't even get out the door. And remember, courage is not something you're born with. It's a decision you make. It's a command of God you keep. That's one of the key things God said to Joshua, the son of Nun, again and again. It was a command. Be strong and of a good courage. Make a decision to be strong. Make a decision to be courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So it's a command you keep, and you are able to fulfill that command because you've got the promise of God being present with you. It's like the analogy of the schoolyard. When there's a bully in the schoolyard, you don't want to go out for lunch or recess. But if your big, strong, older brother is with you, then you can go out in the schoolyard and the bully will be nowhere to be found because big brother is present. Well, we have more than big brother. We have the Lord God himself. And we learn that when God is with you and for you, nothing and no one can be against you. So courage is a decision you make to obey the command of God. And God will help you. Oh, believe me, he will.
That brings us to the third stone. The third stone after conviction and courage is faith. And it's uh, 1 Samuel 17, verse 37. It says, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, this is David speaking, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Well, you see, David had faith partially because of his experience of faith earlier. We build on our experience. He slew a lion, then he slew a bear. So it's only just one more step up to slay a three-meter giant named Goliath. Faith is a wonderful thing. It's a gift that God already gives us. Romans 12, 3, God has given to every man the measure of faith. We don't have to ask so much for faith. We just need to use the faith we have, feed it in God's word, cover it with prayer in the Holy Spirit, be in fellowship with people of faith because it's contagious. And with that faith, you can do all kinds of things that you couldn't do elsewise. Think of it this way. Faith and courage is the opposite of fear and despair. When you have faith and courage, then you're not going to want to give up. You're not going to want to throw in the towel. You're not going to want to retreat and hide when it's every hand on deck and call the people of faith to the front line. The fourth smooth stone, God's name. And that's in 1 Samuel 17, verse 45. Remember what David said. I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. The name of God is not just precious. The name of God is not just holy. The name of God is powerful, very powerful. Now it tells us in Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Simple as that. We learn in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, that when two or three are gathered together in Christ's name, that's in his authority, by his leading, then he is present in the midst of them. And then we learn in Acts 3, verses 6 and 16, about the healing of the lame man at the gate beautiful in the temple precincts of Jerusalem, that in the name of Jesus, and by faith in the name of Jesus, this man has become completely whole. And let's not forget Acts 4, verse 12, that says there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. What a powerful name. Therefore, let's never violate the third commandment, which says, do not use the name of the Lord your God in vain. One person defined that command this way. It's using God's name without thinking about him or doing so in an irrelevant and irreverent manner. So David, who walked with God, was more than authorized to use his name. The fifth and final stone is the anointing. And this is in chapter 16 and verse 13 of 1 Samuel. The anointing. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. There's nothing more powerful and priceless than the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, of course, is known as Christos, or Christos, or Hamashiach, the Anointed One. He's the Anointed of the Anointed. But we who follow him also receive the anointing. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. The oil that is put on the heads of anointed ones is merely a symbol of the invisible presence and power of the Spirit. Remember, the church was birthed in power. On the day the Holy Spirit was poured out wholesale, and that was known as the day of Pentecost. It's described in the second chapter of Acts. Now remember, when you're anointed by the Holy Spirit, you are emboldened, empowered, strengthened, confirmed for global prophetic witness. Why do I say prophetic? Because when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all flesh, sons and daughters can prophesy. So those are the five smooth stones. Conviction, courage, faith, God's name, 
and the anointing. It just took one of those stones to bring down Goliath. And friends, take heart. This time will pass. Or as one person put it, tough times don't last, but tough people do. Well, we become strong by taking up the five smooth stones that God has provided us according to his word. Let me pray for you now in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for our listeners. We pray that you will strengthen them with might by the Spirit in the inner man. We pray that your perfect love will cast out all fear. We pray that they will not dread tomorrow because the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. And we pray, let them take courage, let them exercise faith, let them have rock-solid convictions, let them walk and do everything to the name and glory of you. May they do everything in the anointed, because we are Christians, little anointed ones, followers of Jesus Christ. Bless each and every one we pray, and we look forward to seeing them again in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before you go, friends, please remember to press the subscribe button on your screen. We love to make you part of the community. And remember, you can visit us at any time at our website at tantan.org.au. We're increasingly providing more resource, much of it free, to help build you up in your spiritual life and to face the future with confidence. So until next time, we look forward to your company here at Global Pulpit.